Hello and welcome. I'm not sure whether this is public yet. Welcome everybody. We're starting a bit late for the event Lebanon's crisis, catastrophe and collapse. Is it a turning point for reconstruction and reform? I very warmly welcome you to this very complex topic. And my name is Bento Seller. I'm head of the Middle East and North Africa department at Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin. Our foundation is close to the German Green Party and we are a political foundation doing analysis, supporting civil society actors, and therefore we also have an office in Beirut. I will introduce my colleague who's based there later, who's also here on the panel tonight. But let me first uh, give you a short introduction to the event. As you know, since last autumn, Lebanon has been hit by several crises, uh, political, economically, financially, socially, and also the situation with Corona, as well as the blast that we faced a few weeks ago have not improved the situation. So we have multiple overlapping crises and therefore a situation in which everybody is wondering how can we get out of these? How can we go on from here? And therefore, I'm very happy to have four distinguished experts on Lebanon here with me tonight. Welcome, everybody. I hope that you will be kind with our slight technical difficulties since the connections are not ideal and each part of where we are sitting, some of the participants will have their videos turned off. I would kindly ask everybody who's on the panel to keep their microphones shut while they are not speaking. And if you're in the audience and you're facing technical problems, please uh, drop a line in the chat to Philip. He's our technical host tonight. Also, you might see people on the panel that you're actually not seeing. These are my lovely colleagues, Lena Frisch, who's a part of the organizational team. And we have Birgit with us, Birgit Arnhold, and my colleague, Luisa Rey. Both of them are working with me in the Middle East and North Africa department, and they will be collecting your questions in the respective chats and channeling to me. So thank you for everybody who's in the background supporting this. And I would also like to announce if you're following via Zoom, we have translation and we have interpretation into German <clears throat> here, you will be able to pick the channel. In the Facebook event, unfortunately, there is no possibility to have both as a video, so you can only listen to the English version there. Well, enough of the technical announcements. Uh, really, I'm very happy to have you all here. and. I will introduce the panelists as we go. We have uh, with us, for example, Diana Mualet. She's a journalist from Lebanon. She's a documentary filmmaker, and she has covered a lot of the hotspots of the area, among others. She has done documentary filming in Afghanistan, in Yemen, but she's also focusing on Lebanon, and she's based there with her family. So um, I'm very happy to have you with us, Diana. And I would like to open the panel actually with you. I mentioned the crisis, the different ones briefly. And here, of course, the question is, what kind of leadership do we see by the government? I mean, several governments now have resigned. The current one is not yet established. So maybe it's hard to answer. But what kind of leadership do we see by politicians? And what kind of leadership would we need to make a difference in this very difficult situation? phone is still muted. Hi, can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, well, today one, one activist used this example. Would you ask Pablo Escobar to reform the mafia? Uh, this is a, a satirical example, resembles perfectly what's happening in Lebanon, because we can see a push towards the current leadership to do some reforms. The explosion that took place last month in Beirut port, it was not only an explosion of a port, it was an explosion of the whole political system that was running the country after the end of civil war uh, in 1991. We were a country that is run by warlords, 
by corrupt politicians, by militants uh, who have regional powers that they are serving. I'm, I'm speaking about Hezbollah, allying with uh, sectarian powers in Lebanon. And the, the whole system exploded when the port of Beirut was exploded. Today, unfortunately, the, the, uh, what we see from the international community, mainly the French and European interference, uh, is helping these same politicians. Uh, they're asking them to do the reforms. They are unable to reform themselves. This system has proved again and again that it's deadly, that it's corrupt, that it's beyond correction. We need a different political system that is not sectarian, that is not based on uh, favoritism. We want a, a country that is run by secular leadership, by equal uh, citizenship among all Lebanese, and we don't, uh, that does not favor sect over another or deal with people as uh, they belong to their sects. This ideal, ideal uh, ambition is something that has not been achieved yet. I think we should work on the new blood that we discovered during the uh, uprising that took place on October 17. Many young Lebanese men and women have proved that they are willing to, to present themselves. They have ideas, they have uh, projects for Lebanon, but unfortunately the polit political system is not helping to create this. We need an early election. We need to help these new blood of Lebanese young active uh, members to be uh, represented in a new political system. The current system is not meant to reform itself. So far, I don't see any uh, near solution. I see only extension of the current crisis. I can't hear you, sorry, okay. What an amazing uh, initial statement already. I mean, it sounds very depressing. You mentioned a lot of very That's important... That's reality. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you mentioned several things uh, regarding the system, a sectarian system, a system in which power is kind of inherited. It is shared between the same families so for decades now, and these were already active in the civil war. You said we need a new system that is non-sectarian and that is coming with fresh, fresh characters, so to say. Would you mind sharing where should these come from? And if the system can't reform itself, how should it be reformed? Who should reform it and how? Uh, there are two levels, I guess, important levels that we should focus on. Early elections, where uh, besides the early election, I think the international pressure should focus on uh, uh, disarming Hezbollah because the arms of Hezbollah has been used in creating the electoral law that governed the elections that took place in 2017, which led to Hezbollah having Hezbollah and its allies having the majority in parliament. Second, you have the sectarian system in Lebanon, the uh, corrupt sectarian system that is running the country. Early elections combined with, with uh, serious pressure on the leadership of Hezbollah, that will help having a new leadership in the country. I'm trying to simplify things as much as I can because Lebanese politics is so complicated, but we can go deeper. But I think those two pillars are essential. Early elections with a different electoral law than the current one, plus a serious pressure from the international community towards Iran and Hezbollah. Well, then I would like to come from here to Nizar Hassan, who is a second panelist with us tonight. Nizar is a political researcher and he runs the Lebanese politics podcast. Possibly you have already listened to that. If not, please go and find it because it is every uh, week, I think, delivering new insights and I think it is absolutely worth listening to. So thank you very much for joining Nizar. I think just now Diana mentioned already fresh political elite, new people to take over. She referred to new 
lists participating in previous election with considerable uh, um, success. It's just that the current electoral system did not allow them to really take uh, responsibility through that. You have been dealing with alternative uh, political movements in Lebanon, so maybe you can share with the, us your thoughts on who are the most relevant ones and what kind of political programs do they have? Are they able to formulate programs that would be helpful in this crisis and to overcome it? Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for organizing this. Um, can you hear me well? Great. So yeah, I, I agree with the assessment with, I mean, I, I, to a large extent, I agree with the assessment that Diana provided, which is that the system overall uh, is exploding now, it's disintegrating. And uh, this is not surprising because it's a system based on a very unsustainable path to, to governance uh, or, or a very unsustainable system of governance, which is uh, based on an economic model that has failed and collapsed today and based on large scale corruption in every part of the state and even the public, uh, the private sector that is working with the state. So uh, the system is collapsing. The political class is it's in its weakest position, probably historically since the end of the civil war 30 years ago. The political class have, has never been weaker than today. Their clientelist networks are getting weaker by the fact that, you know, the state is uh, is imposing is, is enacting austerity policies, which means less resources to spread around for your constitu not constituents, sectarian clients is the right word in Lebanon, people of the same religion who follow you uh, politically. Um, and also the, the economic and financial meltdown uh, is so deep that they don't know what to do with it. Uh, and for real, for, for one, I mean, they know that any real solution to this crisis means that it's uh, it's a solution against their own interests. I'm not talking only about the politicians, but also about the bankers, the central banker, the, the cronies of Lebanon, the, the oligarchy of Lebanon that has been ruling the country for a while and now has reached a moment where it's basically failing to manage the country or transition it from this crisis. On the other hand, uh, and that's why we see them so, uh, one more note, that's why we see the politicians so eager to um, to you know, accept any initiatives such as uh, Emmanuel Macron's initiative or uh, uh, you know, uh, IMF funding or any initiative from abroad that will bring in money to the country because that's the only way that would, uh, th they would be able to stay in power. Um, on the other hand, the opposition has been growing and has been, uh, uh, has been manifesting in many different kinds of groups. Uh, some are political parties, some are political organizations that don't call themselves parties. Other are more informal structures and grassroots groups that uh, form around times of protest and uprising, such as the October 17, 2019 uprising. And they are less formal and less consistent, maybe, and less homogeneous. But there are many, many forms of, of, of organizing that has been happening. Uh, but it's facing very, very serious problems. One of them is the weak infrastructure for political activism in Lebanon after long years of exclusive policies by the Lebanese government uh, after, you know, 15 years of Syrian occupation of Lebanon and then, uh, I mean, after the end of the civil war, right? 15 years of Syrian occupation and then after that, a political system where all those who were opponents before kind of took different chairs and starting, started to share power in this uh, in these governments they call national unity government, where each of them can take share, their share of the resources and spread it on uh, to their people. Um, this system has made, very, uh, made it very difficult for a new political organizing. These political parties that we're talking about dominate the public domain uh, on every level, public discourse, media, but also on the grassroots level and the social fabric. What you are allowed to be, what, I, what political identity you're allowed to have uh, is, uh, is very exclusive and very narrow in most areas. There's a lack of resources as well for political groups that are trying to organize uh, I, I've had experiences and, and I've met many political groups that literally spend nothing on their, all of their work. They have absolutely no resources to spend, which, you know, as uh, any political party from any other country would know, this is almost impossible to work with. Uh, but when it comes to proposing visions and, pro and proposals for change, I don't think there's a lack there. Uh, political groups have been putting forward very serious propositions for change, including some general headlines, but also some very, you know, specific policy proposals. They've come around uh, coalitions and policy visions and proposals 
uh, in many occasions, most recently, uh, many groups, I think around 15 or 20 groups came together and put forward this, uh, this document uh, and called people to, and, or, or, and groups and organizations to come around it. And the main proposal or the main vision for change is basically three things. The first one is uh, the, the solving the economic and financial crisis that is happening today but not only solving it in general, right? Not any kind of solution to the crisis, but one that is based on the principle of economic justice. So this crisis is very deep, it's very costly. How do we distribute the costs of this crisis? This is the real question in Lebanon today, be it in politics or economics, it's the same question. How do we distribute the losses of this crisis? And uh, the, uh, distributing them based on, a f on, on fair principles uh, will be the most challenging part because those who are governing are those who have very narrow economic interests. The second one is accountability. And we should never, ever forget about accountability when we're talking about change and reform, because otherwise it makes absolutely no sense. One of the main problems in Lebanon, uh, uh, in this system that we have in Lebanon, is the lack of accountability. When we're talking about corruption, it means the lack of accountability, because if there was accountability, then corruption wouldn't be so widespread and also so impactful on politics and the economics. And how we deal with, with accountability today is very central. Do we say uh, that you know, those who have committed financial or fraud or corruption or crimes such as the, the August 4 port explosion, which was re really not an accident at all, it was basically uh, a crime that has been in the making for years because of this corruption and mismanagement and sectarian power sharing, how do we deal with, this, with, this, uh, with, with these crimes that have been committed against people? The crime of making more than 50% of the Lebanese people or people of Lebanon today below the poverty line and almost a quarter of them below the extreme poverty line, that's a crime as well. Who, is, who will be held responsible for that, right? Everything we're talking about in Lebanon, when we're talking about change, we're talking about accountability. If we don't have, ac have accountability and change at the top level of political institutions, being government, uh, parliament, central bank, and the private sector, then we're not serious about change. So this also is the second main pillar. And the third one is the transition towards a secular state and a state of social justice. Uh, and this transition, perhaps, is the one that is most confusing pe pe to people because they don't see a clear path for this change. The pro political groups, the opposition groups uh, that are in gray, uh, basically entrenched in the October 17 and the revolutionary movement in Lebanon in general have been saying that what we need is a uh, government with, exec with the legislative authority. So a government that can pass laws without going back to parliament for a while before having uh, early elections on a new law. And this new electoral law that they're calling for is a law based not on sectarianism, uh, but based on uh, fair principles of uh, proportional representation, etc. And uh, a lot of other laws, right, that are valid to all of these things that I'm talking about, but we can put them under these three headlines. These are not, you know, some secret solution. Everyone knows that this is actually the, the solution. Even the president, even the political class in Lebanon always speaks of these same things. However, the question is not a question of uh, policy today. The question is a question of political power and political interests and economic interests. Uh, those in power today don't have interest in changing anything because they have benefits from the system and they're trying to save their backs today by not paying the costs of the crisis and of the political collapse. Uh, everyone else should be pressuring for them to be held accountable and for serious political change to be happening in the country. Thank you very much, Nizar. There are a number of points uh, where I would also like to come back to when it comes to how can we implement all these ideas that are there, how can it really happen, the change that is needed. So we'll definitely come back to that. However, I would like to um, ask Rosalie, Rosalie Berthier is with us from Synapse. Uh, Synapse is a think tank based in Lebanon. It is a research network that is focusing on economic affairs, but not exclusively. But Rosalie Berthier, an expert who has uh, been living in the region in Lebanon, in Egypt, and in Turkey, um, uh, Rosalie is focusing on Lebanese macroeconomics at the moment. And I would like to pick up one point of 
what Nizar just mentioned, um, solving the economic and economic social crisis and then getting to the political topics. I mean, this is something that we hear from many states that are unable or unwilling to perform political reform. They suggest then to take economic reforms up as first topic and then only come to political questions that might be more tricky. But would that work in Lebanon? I mean, here, from my, from what I see, the political and the economic and financial crisis seem to be so entangled that I'm not sure. Would that be a path that would be possible at all? Let alone, is it desirable? Rosalie, please. Good evening and thanks for the kind introduction. I've seen the message about putting the camera on. I'm actually just going to remain uh, without camera because the, the connection is bad. But uh, And do tell me if you don't hear me well because the sound cut at my end. So great. Uh, so thanks a lot for the question. Uh, to me, the, 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 the premise of, you know, starting with economics and then moving to, to politics is very ambiguous because the economy in Lebanon is extremely politicized. And I think it's a mistake to think we can deal with the economy without the politics. And uh, it's, it's a good entry point because there's a position, so if, you know, economics versus politics is, uh, has always been a problem in Lebanon. So, uh, when I started working on the Lebanon's economy a few years ago, I was trying to get foreign actors interested in the economy, trying to tell them it's important for political stability. But it was a total fail. And uh, I think, you know, economy is not very sexy. And people wanted to look at politics, you know, geopolitics, government formation, refugees, uh, you name it. But the balance sheet of the central bank wasn't really like something uh, people were interested in. So I'm glad it's an issue people are now looking at, but it's important to always remember it has to be looked uh, with, uh, you know, politics in mind as well. So can we make economic reform work in Lebanon? I see three main points we need to focus on. The first one is we need to stop thinking about, you know, Lebanon as a unique economic system. Lebanon has been a rent economy for years. Uh, it relies on foreign currency, uh, which comes from very unproductive sources. So right now it's the debt. Uh, before that, it was political money from nationalization or, or for support for the Palestinian cause. Uh, and this, this rent economy sustains a very strong currency, so the pound. And the day the, inc you know, the, the foreign income uh, slows down, the currency takes a hit. This is what we're, we're seeing now but it's not particularly sophisticated as a system and we, sh we should stop seeing it as such. And, uh, and it's, it's an economy and we should treat it as an economy. So for example, we need to, to start, ask, see basic accounting documents and practices. So, you know, uh, uh, Nizar was referring to, to you know, the central bank and, and the opacity of the central bank. So, you know, we need uh, the balance sheet of the central bank. It has, we haven't had that for years. We need an audit of the state account. The state account haven't been audited since 2005, and you know we need we need standard practices and international standard to apply to Lebanon like everywhere else. So, for example, recently the the central bank suspending a, an international uh, norm which is called IFRS uh, nine. So that's a norm on on how do you record losses, and so with the suspension now commercial bank in Lebanon are allowed to under-report the loss that they will incur in relation uh, to public bonds. So, you know, that's, to me, that's, you know, this kind of, of problems should be tackled hand on. The second one is, um, refers to what Diana was mentioning, uh, is that we cannot, you know, the objective cannot be to sustain the system as it is, because it's a system that serves the super rich, uh, and it serves the super rich only at the expense of everything else. So it's true that it's a system where, you know, you have this illusion that the middle class and, you know, a lot of Lebanese somehow benefit from it. So, so, so for years, you know, like um, the middle class has been indirectly benefiting from the strong currency because they were able to, um, to consume imported go goods, to go on holidays, to have, uh, you know, house employees, uh, you know, all of this, all of this thing that they wouldn't be able to if they hadn't had a, a strong currency. But that's actually just leftovers from a system that's extremely expensive on the state and on the society and that really rewards only the 1%. And it rewards the 1% to an insane degree. And, um, and uh, so we don't have many figures in Lebanon, but the last one we had on the banking sector from 2017 
under uh, you know the share of different uh, different deposit accounts showed that one percent of the deposit accounts held 50 percent of the total amount of money deposited in Lebanon so we're not talking about one percent of the population we're talking about one percent of the depositors or that's about half of the population already so it's a it's about a thousand six hundred accounts which held like half of the total again so you know it's really like the one percent and uh, and the, so the regular Lebanese already pays the price, you know, like the, the product of the economy is what push many Lebanese, many talented Lebanese to go and seek, uh, uh, you know, a better opportunity abroad. This is what limits the development of an industry, of an agriculture. And so they're paying the price now, they will pay the, the price for years, if it's not decades. So, so, and it will be very expensive. So we can't just, you know, trying to keep the system afloat, whether it's politic, the politician, like the public system or the economic system. It's a problem because this is what the previous uh, donor conferences did. And it's always, you know, giving a little bit more time for the system, whether on political side or economic side, and uh, just increasing like the, its bad habits. So that's, that's my last point. And as a consequence of the uh, previous two, and that ties to what Nizar was talking about, about accountability. I think it's, we need to seek responsibility. We cannot just continue bailing out uh, the financial and political elite like we've done. Like the previous conference organized by, by, by the French was organized right before the election. Uh, so that sounds, you know, that sends the, the wrong message. And I'm not talking about conditionality here. I'm just talking about refusing to explicitly endorse a dysfunctional system. It's, it's a bit different. And, and so you were, uh, Bente, you were referring to, you know, reforms. So I think we need to do reform, but it can't be cosmetic reforms because that won't solve the problem. So if we're asking, if we take the, the electricity sector, for example, if we're asking for more transparency, you know, it's not just having a regulator. It's having a regulator that's appointed with the best practices and we have to make sure the process is followed. Otherwise, we'll just, you know, have more of the same. And then, you know, in the electricity sector, to, to keep that example, Lebanon will need international firms to invest and they won't invest if there is no, like if there is a risk of being associated with like mismanagement and uh, you know, uh, uh, like actually clear cut corruption, it's too costly for them. So there's this, I think we need to support the actors who actually want to support the law because in, in many cases in Lebanon, the law exists, it's there, it just needs to be applied, it needs to be respected, started with the constitution. And I think, and that's maybe something we can discuss later in, in the discussion, but we need to question our, our uh, revisit our role as, as international actors. You know, what, what do we do and what, you know, what do we allow and, uh, and would we actually, you know, what's our, what's our role there? Thank you very much, Rosalie, for this introduction to how the political and the economic cannot be separated and how for decades the system has been hollowed out. Uh, there are very important things that you mentioned regarding transparency, regarding dropping the standards, which obviously is a hindrance for international support. And you have also been warning against uh, unconditional support or support that might give the wrong signals, to put it in a more neutral way. I would like to ask my colleague Joachim Paul, who is head of our Beirut office, for his uh, view on what international actors can actually do. Joachim has been living in a number of different contexts and as my colleague, he has been head of our Ramallah office for many years, head of our Tunis uh, office. After that, he took last year the Beirut office. Joachim, please give us an insight. What do you hear? What would be desirable for international actors to do? How can they support Lebanon, not only in the emergency situation caused by the blast, but to overcome the long-term crisis and, and to find back on a stable way? Uh, thank you, Bente. Hello to my, to my fellow panelists and the audience in general. Uh, thanks for having me here. Um, I just would like uh, to shed light on the, actually the multiple crises Lebanon is in. Of course, we have seen the terrible and devastating port blast uh, on the 4th of August and um, the new humanitarian situation it created. But this happened after Corona hit, and um, and um, you know the uh, the health sector, the um, hospitals, etc., um, were already totally overloaded. Um, we have 
the financial crisis that Rosalie already mentioned, as a financial crisis that was uh, created by the actually the, the banks and the financial elite, uh, the central bank itself, um, and in general the economic crisis. Uh, just as a figure, on 85% of all goods that are consumed in Lebanon have to be imported. There, uh, there are no dollars, there is no international currency anymore to do this, to sustain the system. So I think, every, it, I think we all agree on it and it's clear to everybody that Lebanon needs international aid and it needs financial support to reform itself and um, to find a way out of this multiple uh, crisis. Talking about uh, those crises, we all know that there is a regional dimension to the problems that uh, Lebanon is in and that um, the, the regional actors um, have their influence in Lebanon, are like with um, Lebanese actors, which adds to uh, the, the very complicated system the country is in. So, to your question, what should international actors do? On one hand, and um, Rosalie mentioned uh, the, 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 a, the donors conference, I think you meant the CEDRE conference in 2018, um, demanding the Lebanese, the established political system to reform itself. There's a set of reforms that came back on the table in the uh, negotiations between the previous Lebanese government and the IMF and um, those conditions uh, and demands that Macron came back with in his French initiative. Um, to restructure the financial system, to, um, um, to create an independent government, to audit the financial institution, the forensic, forensic audit, uh, audit of the federal bank, um, an independent judiciary, and create an um, anti-corruption body to reform the electoral law. These are um, um, some of the main key demands, including the more economic ones, like reforming the, the electricity sector, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. If um, the, the current political system would respond to these reforms, um, it would basically create, uh, or it would, it would basically um, um, it would basically need to step aside and to uh, let others uh, join in. So are those elites um, able to do this? I think the answer has been um, has been answered has been given before. Now, what can um, the international donors community do to uh, to not go by the um, the political system, but extend aid? To, um, to the Lebanese population, humanitarian aid after the port blast, um, aid to the refugee population in Lebanon. Let's not forget that um, 1.5 million Syrian refugees are living uh, for years in the country. Um, and, um, um, yeah, and other forms of humanitarian aid. Importantly, there need to be a very strict monitoring in collaboration with civil society and very strong um, um, checks and balances how the, in, the international aid that comes in is being spent. There needs to be a support and, um, and cooperation with the many very active civil uh, society organizations. And we need to better understand who is out there on the alternative political spectrum. Um, my my co-panelist mentioned before alternative new emerging political actors. I think it is not quite 
clear who will be out there um, um, and preparing for elections if there will be a new electoral law um, and uh, who will have a chance if there will be those cracks in the system to participate in it. But I think uh, this is uh, also part of our role to understand who is there and what kind of networking and cooperation there can be. Um, and another point that has not been mentioned, but I think it is important, we have seen during the past weeks, those votes with people who seem to have nothing to lose or very little to lose, trying to reach Cyprus from the Lebanese coast. Uh, so uh, I think we need to understand that the humanitarian and general, you know, social economic conditions are deteriorating very quickly that um, within less than a year the situation came to this dramatic low of the economic and social situation that people are trying to leave with all, sort, with all uh, means they have the country and I do think that they need as well um, rescue, you know, preparations for rescue um, in the Mediterranean. So, so far from, from my point. Thank you, Joachim. Um, there is a number of questions that are already coming. Be assured that we are uh, collecting them and we will be clustering them to ask them. Actually, uh, there is a very relevant question because all of you mentioned there is a need to reform and it needs to really uh, be a deep change, a change in the system, a change away from corruption. And here I think everybody would like to know how can this really happen? I mean, those who are in, in, in a position to change the electoral law, for example, would need to come up with a new one. And we've seen with the previous discussion on the ele electoral law, it just got much more complicated as a reforms led to a law that I think was much more difficult for voters to understand. And in the end, it was not really a law meant to change away from the system, but it was confirming the sectarian system. So maybe uh, Diana and Nizar, I would like to hear your thoughts on like, very briefly, how would you say should the next steps look like? which would be the entities needed to do an electoral law reform that really happens as well as, as that could monitor and curb corruption. Uh, I would like to ask you for one thing. We have translation, we have interpreters here who need to bring your complex thoughts into German. So uh, even though I'm, I'm afraid it is very little time that we have for this discussion altogether, can you kindly speak slowly when you answer these questions? Diana, please go first. Okay, thank you. I will try to speak a bit slowly. Uh, as you, as you, as Nizar mentioned earlier, I guess, I think it's Nizar who mentioned it, that the current parliament who created the previous electoral law cannot form a new one because they designed the law on their side so they come to power. We need an independent uh, representation, a government that is able to create a new electoral law. The examples of the new electoral law are there. It's, we're not uh, discovering a new, uh, something out of, of the sky. There are some studies, there are some very serious uh, uh, experts who have come with some uh, models of how the electoral law should work. We lack the will to implement those new ideas that can bring new powers. That's why, it's not enough just to create a new law. You need to have a serious international, uh, inter not interference, pressure on the current uh, leadership, political leadership, to be able to enforce a new, more balanced law that can help us have a new leadership in the country. It's not enough. The law by itself is important, but it's not enough. We have to think of who is going to issue the law. Isn't the current parliament? I don't expect the current parliament is able to do this, this mission. It's a serious question that we need to address. We need to think of the law and who will be able to create this law. 
Yeah, so we have uh, the question of the law, but you said there are organizations, I know LADE or Legal Agenda have been working on the topic of elections for a long time. Absolutely. Thinking it thoroughly. However, then your idea to establish an independent commission, somehow a commission, you mean, that is outside the political elite, a new body. Um, Legal Agenda and LADE are excellent. But they are more the advisors. I mean, when it yes. comes to implementation yes. in acting the law and then really making sure what is stipulated there happens, what kind of body would we need for that? And how would we get a legitimate entity? Would that be something that already comes out of elections or how would you picture that? I think we need to form a new government that is not based on the power sharing that we have already in Lebanon. We need really independent, independent figures that does not represent the Shia bloc or the Christian bloc or the Sunni bloc as it is being discussed at, at this particular moment. We need serious representation in the government that can come up with solution for economical situation and for the political uh, and for the electoral law that can help us lead the way for serious and new elections. Without that, I, I think we'll be still uh, moving around the same problem. I see somebody suggesting in the chat that if this problem could be resolved, that would already possibly be the start to all the other problems. Nizar, what is your take on it? How could we find uh, the way to really uh, not only have ideas, but to implement them? And uh, I mean, we have to deal with the number of power centers. Therefore, I would like to add the question that we had also touched upon before um, an end to uh, like um, Hezbollah being an armed actor, uh, disarmament of Hezbollah and an end to its dominant role or its very strong role in Lebanese politics. That, for example, I imagine very difficult to be implemented and I see it coming as a question. How would that help? How would it be done? Right, so let's divide the, the question into, um, into first the issue of elections and the presentation, and then we talk about Hezbollah. Um, when it comes to elections, right now the political class is basing, its, it's claiming legitimacy based on the 2018 parliamentary elections, which as you said, was based on a law that was designed and tailored in every single detail to maximize their presentation of sectarian powers and to minimize the risk of new forces especially secular forces breaking through the system. So the, the results of these uh, the elections kind of reflect the law itself and the political system rather than public opinion. And moreover, more importantly, in my opinion, uh, is the fact that we had an uprising, one of the biggest uh, movements in the history of the country, probably the biggest anti-establishment uprising in the history of the country happening last year. And uh, this uprising was a moment where people from across Lebanon uh, came together and took their to the street to say that we don't trust the political establishment anymore and we want to change it. So to say that the legitimacy of political forces is still here because in 2018 they made uh, they, they made they had good results in the elections. Uh, this uh, kind of turns a blind eye to what people have been expressing in the streets, and we have to get out of this mentality of uh, restricting our understanding of our demo of democracy to elections and representation because the uprising itself, in my opinion, is the most democratic uh, phenomenon and one of the most democratic ways of expressing not only rage but also aspiration for change. So the results of 2018, which the political class is basing its legitimacy on, are garbage. They don't, they don't represent anything today. Uh, what we know for sure is that the, the, anger is, the anger is very strong and also the support for new movements is relatively strong. Obviously, uh, there aren't any parties that are so, so strong that they can mobilize uh, as many uh, people as, uh, as the major parties in Lebanon. But we have many groups and many parties that are coming together, as I was uh, talking about earlier. Allah, when it comes to the next uh, parliamentary elections, if we have an election to, tomorrow on the same, based on the same law, we probably have five or six MPs from, from uh, opposition movements uh, breaking through. This is really insignificant when you talk about the revenue system and the kind of change it needs. Uh, so you need a definitely, you definitely need a new law, a new electoral law. And the way to do it, uh, I think there's only way to, one way to do it today. Uh, if we don't want the whole system and the whole state to collapse completely, and then who knows what kind of entities will take power and, uh, and impose their agenda, 
then we need to have a government that has the authority of uh, enacting an electoral law and other laws as well, not only an electoral law, but enacting an electoral law that represents uh, this vision for change, right? And this government has to have legislative authority. This is why the political groups are focusing on this point so much, because without, without this point, what will happen is, even if the, we have the best people in the Council of Ministers, what will happen is that they will uh, make great laws and then uh, submit them to Parliament, and Parliament will shoot them down or transform them in a way that uh, kind of uh, rids them of their essence of uh, the most important parts of them. So. This is not an option. This is uh, just a policy, a, a prescription for failure. Uh, we cannot do anything without a government that is strong enough to, uh, to impose uh, certain laws. And one of the most important laws is, is the electoral reform, but also we have other laws that we desperately need. One of them is the independence of the judiciary law, uh, which seeks to change the way the judiciary works in Lebanon so that it's immune from political interference. This is very central because without a strong judiciary, then the collapse of the state and the Lebanese society overall, if you wish, is inevitable. Without an independent judiciary and an authority that has some credibility and can impose laws in a real uh, non-discriminatory way, then it's impossible to think of, of reform or change or the protection of people who are voicing their, exp their opinion, et cetera. Um, so there are many laws. There is also the issue of centralization and decentralization, which not many people think about, but has a lot of political significance and implications as well, because the Lebanese system is structured in a way where the political parties that can take control of the central government can impose their wish on every part of the country, because local governments, which are more prone to political change and are more more based on the real needs of people and the grass on the grassroots level don't have the resources don't have the jurisdiction to uh, to impose change to carry out economic development etc um, so they, I see the electoral law and the electoral reform as one of the paths to uh, change and not the only one and I see uh, no value in demanding early elections unless it's on based on a new law otherwise we're really shooting ourselves in the foot uh, when it comes to Hezbollah, this is the most difficult, uh, obviously, topic in Lebanon because um, on one end, uh, any analyst of the Lebanese situation uh, who is not affiliated with Hezbollah and not very biased would say that Hezbollah is a major obstacle facing progressive change in Lebanon, facing any kind of change because Hezbollah is a militia that has extreme power compared to uh, the other factions, but also compared to the state, and it can impose its agenda, and it has proven uh, in the last years that it doesn't mind going as far as using its weapons internally in order to impose its agenda. And one of the, one of the man manifestations was uh, in the October 17 uprising, where basically people from Hezbollah's uh, supposed communities or support base were taking part in the protests, and how Hezbollah dealt with it was by threatening, was by uh, uh, propagating uh, conspiracy theories about uh, embassies and foreign powers funding the movement and directing it according to their own wishes. Uh, a lot of propaganda, a lot of violence, uh, sending uh, young men to, 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 the, to downtown Beirut to beat up protesters or in areas where Hezbollah has a large influence, burning tents, etc. There was a lot of, uh, there was a clear counter-revolution role that Hezbollah is playing. So this is not a debatable issue in my opinion. Hezbollah is one of the most counter-revolutionary and one of the most reactionary forces in Lebanon, and it's a threat on the continue on, on the on any kind of vision for change uh, that you would have for the country. So, in that sense, that we agree on that. When it comes to how we deal with the issue of Hezbollah, I see it differently than than Diana. Uh, what Diana mentioned in the beginning, I don't think that an international international pressure to disarm Hezbollah today. Um, will bring anything in Lebanon except civil war. There's, let's not kid ourselves. Hezbollah is ready to go wherever it takes in order to make sure that it, uh, it maintains its military capacity today. And to think that political forces that are aligned with the West uh, can succeed in pressuring Hezbollah into something like this would be just going back to May 2008 and hoping that things would happen differently. This will not happen differently. We will go to war and in war the militias and the sectarian powers will win. You will probably have Hezbollah on one hand and the Lebanese forces on, the, on another hand and having strong militias and, and the whole civil war scenario back in the game. I don't want that. I don't think that's a good uh, vision for change. And also, uh, in my opinion, if change doesn't happen on the grassroots level in all communities, regardless of uh, political affiliation, current or, or previous political affiliations, then it doesn't have real potential. So in that sense, what I think uh, uh, the solution or the, uh, the, the, the path is, 
is first of all, we need real serious organizing on the grassroots level uh, in all areas in Lebanon. And we need uh, pressure on all actors, all political actors, uh, to open up the public domains. And this will happen, in my opinion, because of the, uh, the uprising and the movements that we've had. Uh, but what we also need is a serious dialogue about, uh, about Hezbollah's uh, Hezbollah as an entity and its future and its military future because we have a large section of the population that says basically I don't trust Hezbollah as politicians but I trust them as a resistance movement and if Israel attacks tomorrow no one will protect us right and this is an opinion that is held by a lot of people and to dismiss it completely and say no the Lebanese army will protect you or this or that side it's it's almost you know naive in my opinion because we've seen from history that nothing has stopped Israeli aggression accept a balance of power. I'm not saying that Hezbollah's military presence has to remain at all. I have quite the opposite. I hope that this sol solution to this, will uh, we can find a solution to this in the near future because otherwise we cannot build a real state in Lebanon, to be very clear. But to take the confrontational path to this and say, uh, let's uh, create a coalition that is anti-Hezbollah from local and from international forces, that's uh, running off the cliff, in my opinion. It's a complex topic, but it requires real uh, organizing and real social dialogue among people to reach a, a solution that many people uh, see as safe and, and fair for them. Can I respond? Please. Go Can ahead. I respond? Yeah, okay. Yes, please. First, when I mentioned uh, uh, exercising pressure on Hezbollah, I did not use the word force. I did not mean to disarm Hezbollah by force. I think the policy of sanctions over leadership of Hezbollah and some members who are allied to Hezbollah is a successful policy. Of course, if we are asking any internal power in Lebanon to disarm Hezbollah, we're taking Lebanon to a civil war. This is not what I'm asking. But Hezbollah's arm is internal tool. It's not used to balance power with Israel anymore. Since, 2000, uh, 11, since the year 2000, since the Israelis withdrew from Lebanon, this arm, Hezbollah arm, has been used against us, as against Lebanese, against Syrians, against everybody but Israel. So let's put the Israeli issue aside. This is something that cannot be solved via Hezbollah. The arms of Hezbollah has been used against us Lebanese on political uh, level and on uh, all levels in, in the country. Yes, we cannot disarm Hezbollah internally. I agree with Nizar that a major factor in Lebanon is Hezbollah and to have a strong state that is uh, viable and that can really build the country, we should not have a strong small state next to it. But solving the Hezbollah issue is not something internal. There should be a pressure over Iran. It, it should be a, a regional agreement. Lebanon, according to its dynamic cannot solve the arms of Hezbollah. This is a fact. But at the same time, saying that we can run the country and keep this issue till it's, re uh, till it's resolved within other uh, dynamics, I think we are still taking the country again and again to another problem. Lebanon has suffered a lot in the past 30 years. Yes, from a poli uh, corrupt political system, from warlords, but the issue of Hezbollah has extended this and has benefited from this. It's not the issue of Israel. Israel, we can discuss this topic later on. Hezbollah something or an issue that should be addressed internationally. And I'm not saying by force. There are agreements that are taking place. There are several kinds of pressure. We have seen it on different uh, uh, issues. I think that should be dealt as well with Hezbollah. Thank you. I mean, there are so many things to say regarding that. Let me just uh, mention that in the chat, I see a very uh, nice comment that I'd like to read out. Thanks a lot for your inspiring contributions. You put a lot of trust and international pressure on the elites, but in the end, the whole system is colonial legacy and the product, product of the Taif agreement. And here the person in the end says, what about a bottom-up pressure? And I think you all have been referring to that. You all have been saying how important, how relevant and how rich the protests are. So uh, thank you for that comment, but also thank you for your very interesting um, points regarding Hezbollah. It's a very 
um, big topic, how to shape a role of every actor in the state, what to do with international um, actors and what can internal actors do. And it would absolutely be worth dedicating it a conference on its own. But from this macro perspective, I would like to zoom in on one, one thing with you, Rosalie, because one thing that I saw in the media was that uh, Syrian affiliate Jamil al Jamil al Sayed claimed the Ministry of Finance. Then it was mentioned that both Amal and Hezbollah insisted the Ministry of Finance would need to be in Shiite hands. What difference would it make? I mean, looking at the needs for reform and international support, I would say the Ministry of Finance would play a crucial role. Would it then be possible for international actors that are discussing sanctions or have already imposed sanctions on Hezbollah to go via the Ministry of Finance if it was in the hands of Hezbollah? What do you think? Does it make a difference? So on, on Hezbollah specifically, I'm, 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 not, uh, I'm not an expert, but uh, so the reason why the, the financial minister is so important is because it countersigns most decisions because it usually has, uh, you know, fiscal consequences or budgetary consequences. So it's, it's kind of, it's a ministry. You're not just in control of what happened in finance, but you're in control of what happens everywhere. So that's why it's, it's such a crucial uh, position. My problem with the, you know, like, uh, and I think that refers back to what Diana and Isaria are mentioning, you know, there is no law or no, uh, you know, like specific regulation that, that says this minister should go to Amal or Hezbollah or any other. And it's, and it's actually, so there was, a, in the comments you were, you were reading, there's a, a reference to Taif. Actually, the letter of the constitution is quite interesting and uh, very different from what people have been interpreted, like, you know, the interpretation people have, have made of it. Diana mentioned uh, Legal Agenda, who's doing a tremendous job on, on, that, on that level in terms of, like, helping people understand what the law is about. And I think that's, that's a big problem in Lebanon. It's not, you know, it's so that you have problems, you need legislation, you definitely uh, need a better um, uh, electoral law, and, and some, some laws still need to be you know, voted and, 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 and passed in parliament, but most of it actually needs to be just implemented as it was supposed to be implemented. I mean, as, as it was designed and for the purpose it was designed for. And, and when I was referring earlier to, you know, the fact that we, we cannot as international actors, whatever, you know, whatever the scale, uh, just be complicit of that. It, it, this is part of what I was mentioning. It's not just about uh, like it's not conditionality. It's just saying you know you're you're requesting something that's not in the law and that's not constitutional and that's not you know that that uh, doesn't work with what uh, what the rules which you know there, there are a few but there are some uh, are. So I think it's a to me that's that's an important point in the in the overall uh, discussion we should have with the authorities. Thank you. I saw Joachim making signs. You wanted to add something to this as well, right? Uh, yes, thanks, Bente. Um, I, I mean, we went very much to the, the regional dimension, the role of Hezbollah, um, um, like regional approach um, that would then have its impact on Lebanon. I mean, it shows only on the other hand, we were discussing the electoral law, the financial crisis, um, how the economic crisis erupted in Lebanon. Um, I mean, uh, over the past 10, 10 or 12 months or so, it only shows how complex and interwoven all, uh, all the, the, the problems and the issues are. So um, I, again wanted to bring uh, you know into the light also and uh, to look at how quickly the economic and social situation deteriorated and how important it is on, in, in a very short term um, to provide uh, support and aid to um, to the Lebanese and uh, as well the, refu the refugee population in, in Lebanon. Having said that, I'm, I agree with uh, Nizar that um, only a reform of um, the electoral law, how important it is, I totally agree, 
And by the way, as Stiftung, we cooperate with the organizations that were mentioned twice, Legal Agenda and LADE, on those issues of um, independent uh, judiciary and electoral law. But to have um, a new law and possibly early elections will uh, not create a profound change on because actors have to be ready, they have to organize, um, and um, the, the established elite will not just stand aside and let others to come in. So there need to be a process of pressure on the system to, to, to um, um, see that there are reforms being enacted to allow um, alternative actors to be ready and um, to have an, an impact on the actual policies in the country, I would say. And once again, we are at the point where we say for elections and for a new electoral law, probably that would take time. That would not be a question that you can solve uh, quickly, particularly not in the current situation where there are lots of restricting factors like uh, Corona, the need to, to socially distance, etc. So it's really a very difficult situation. At the same time, I'd say probably there is not that much time for addressing very urgent problems. And I mean, once again, the economy, uh, Rosalie, I think I have also a question here uh, that is uh, coming via Facebook where somebody is saying, well, Lebanon, Lebanon's current deficit is just huge and it has been big for many, many years. Uh, this means the country has to borrow money, but the, ba the, ba the basis is not sustainable for that. Is there any plan to bring this into balance. And so my question would be, even if elections will happen later, even if the basis for political reform can come later, what can we do as international community to, to help Lebanon in this moment without doing what you previously warned of, without bailing it out for just giving the elite some more time? Would you have some ideas on measures that would be possible to implement before elections and before addressing the major reforms that are meaningful and that really help um, uh, uh, the population, especially we heard about the 50% that are below the poverty line, 25% being even in extreme poverty. That is quite a pressing situation, I'd say. What would be your thoughts on what can be done? Uh, that's actually a huge question because <laughs> that's uh, that's uh, what everybody would like an answer to. So I, I have few elements and, and I, I'd love uh, to hear from others because I imagine you you also have opinion about that. But so to me, the, the um, you know, the economic situation of Lebanon has been pressing since the first international donor conferences in the end of the 90s. That was Paris 1. We're like the equivalent of Paris 4 and 9. Like, and we're going to organize probably price five conference so, you know, and nothing has changed. We're in the same situation, same political class and you know, same, same underlying problems. So an enormous debt uh, and productive economy and, uh, and a political class that's allied with, uh, with, uh, with the economic class for sharing the cakes. So it's, it's you know, it's, this is, hasn't changed and this just cannot continue. So, so I think uh, the, the, the pressing needs in terms of, reforming is about tackling the problems of the banking sector. The banking sector is, you know, is defaulting to the state is responsible, the, the public has spent so much money, it's wasting funds, it's corruption, it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's paying civil servants uh, to an absurd degree. So all of this is true, but also what enabled the system is the banking sector. And so, and so I think, you know, basic, uh, basic uh, decisions such as uh, uh, a control of capital, for example, uh, you know, basic things like that would help kind of control the problems within the banking sector because today what you have is an informal capital control. So if you're a regular Lebanese and you have money at the bank, you are effectively under capital control. So you cannot send money abroad, you cannot withdraw it in the currency you deposit it in, and, uh, and you, can, uh, you cannot you know, you cannot use it at, at will. So it's, 
it's it's a, it, cre it creates a very um, absurd situation, honestly, it's completely absurd. So the, the banks created this notion that there is fresh money and then not fresh money. That's but like by the way, that's like that has no economic fund, like foundation. That's that's purely uh, the the banking sector uh, like kind of trying to uh, solve it, like you know, save itself. So they just created this new currency, which would be fresh currency, fresh dollars. The rest would be uh, would be non fresh. And then and then the bank have a discretionary power. So if if you right now want to send your uh, you know your your young ad adult a daughter or son to do that is abroad because you know they, they they have they've been involved in a masters or the bank can actually refuse to send the money on the ground that they don't need a masters uh, so you know that's that's discretionary power that you don't want to give economic private economic actors so I think it's either everybody's money stuck here and that's capital control or nobody's money stuck there but you you know you, it can't be like if you're rich and powerful then you can do whatever you want if you're not then then you have to obey by all this like weird uh, laws. Which, you know, by the way, all the decisions that have been taken by the system. So here it's the ABL, so um, the bank, the Lebanese Bank Association, and the central bank are mainly to safeguard the system itself. And when we say safeguard the system, we're talking about the shareholders of the bank, which are uh, connected uh, one way or another in Lebanon to the political elite. Uh, that, that's that's not work. Uh, I've done that's a great work that Chaban has, uh, has put forward where he shows the connection between the banking sector and, and, the, and the political elite so that's you know that's not that's not a new uh, new um, news I'm breaking and so, so you know like I think uh, the banking sector should be because for now that's the that's the biggest uh, that's the biggest problem in terms of um, inequality of, of treatment and then it's about how do you design support that goes to Lebanese so I think that there was uh, uh, quite a strong call after the blast, like many civil society actors, many activists, many academics call for it. And I think it's been heard, but it would need to be kind of further deployed. You know, how do you reach Lebanese without going through uh, established and like established, you know, NGO cover, which would actually be uh, political parties, uh, NGOs or foundation affiliated with, uh, with uh, politicians or political elite. So it's how do you design support that really directly reach reach those in need. So so then then it's you know it has to it has to be tailored to to the to the specific needs. So if we're facing food shortages for food shortages, then it's you know how do you deliver food parcel directly without intermediaries and without you know using uh, the network of well the political elite because those are the one who have the network on the ground. Uh, if if we're talking about education, so right now you have, of course, access to school because a lot of a lot of pupils used to go to the private sector and they can no longer afford it. But that's you know before that there is also access to just material, so pen, uh, you know, notebook. That's becoming increasingly expensive for most people. So if if this is the support that's needed, then how do you make sure it's delivered to families directly without the intermediary of X or Z or Y uh, foundation? So I think it's about trying to remove as, as, as much as possible the intermediaries. And great. I, once again, we see how complicated it will be, but I find some very valuable points in what you just said, really practical things that can be done and other ideas how to go further in developing plans, how to get there. And I, yeah, I hope, I mean, you in the, in the beginning of answering the question already said it, everybody would love to have the answer to that. And I think the same as well as the question of how to shape political power uh, would be crucial for the political system. You mentioned uh, some very important topics that need to be solved, but where we don't yet really see a solution that can be implemented. From the chat, I would like to come to a different topic because we talked about the international influence that certain actors are having in Lebanon and how that impacts what can happen in Lebanon. Other people are also asking regarding the Syrian and the Palestinian refugees with about 1 million Syrian or probably more than 1 million Syrian refugees and up to half a million of Palestinian refugees that have been in, in Lebanon some, some for decades and of course many of the Syrian refugees after 2013-14 
how does that impact the situation? How is the government going to handle it when it comes to aid that uh, un until now mainly came to uh, provide for refugees, but then more and more Lebanese are in need is one of the questions. And a third question related to this is how does the presence of these refugees possibly also change changes uh, the demographics of Lebanon, especially in a sectarian system? Is their presence relevant and what will come out of it? Um, well, Diana, maybe you want to answer one or more of these questions? Yes, sure. Uh, the issue of, the, of demography has been used and abused several times in, during uh, Leban Lebanon's history, during before the civil war, during the civil war, and even today. So uh, I think the question of the Syrian refugees and before that, Palestinian refugee. First of all, it's a humanitarian question. Why these people had to come to Lebanon? This is the main issue. Who caused their trauma? Why did they come to Lebanon? The issue starts here. The Palestinians have been dragged from their country, from home, their, their homeland, and the Syrians have escaped a dictatorship that is Bashar al-Assad. Lebanon, unfortunately, the current leadership of Lebanon plays on the feeling of fear. Uh, asking mainly the Lebanese Christian, uh, stressing that these refugees will change the demography of Lebanon and it will create more Muslims and the balance of the sectarian power will not be on their favor. And they played by information, by facts, so that they introduce the refugees as if, as if they are the cause of the problem, as if they are the cause of Lebanese problem. This has been the case in the previous years, especially after, uh, before and after uh, General Michel Aoun uh, became uh, become a president. That was the rhetoric that used against refugees. Whereas if you look at facts, despite all the burden that Lebanon's carry before, because of the refugees, I'm not undermining that it's a big issue and should be addressed and it's beyond Lebanon's capacity. But the way the Lebanese government, the way the Lebanese authority have dealt with it is catastrophic on all levels. It did not help the Lebanese and, and, and did not help the Syrian and Palestinian refugees. They played by the facts and also they abused the, uh, the international aid. Lebanon has received a huge uh, number of, of uh, international support because of the Syrian refugees and the, Syria and the Lebanese community have benefited from that. This kind of information the Lebanese authority have tried several times to hide it, not to show it and play by it. So I will, I will shorten, I will uh, simplify the issue. Yes, we have a crisis and it's adding up and now we're seeing more and more problems when it comes to the refugees. But to me, it's not something that cannot be sold. There is a kind of uh, interest in the international community, not enough for sure, but to address the issue of refugees. And we, Lebanon should manage those uh, uh, aids by the international community to help refugees settle. And then maybe once they have a safe uh, come back, to, uh, return to their country, then they can go back, but not force them and not play by numbers and play by realities. It's an issue that Lebanon alone cannot solve. The current sentiment that is playing by uh, the current political system is not helping at all, at all. It's adding up to the problem and not solving it. Thank you, Diana. Please, Nizar, would you comment? And can I remind you of uh, speaking a bit slowly because of the interpretation? Sure. Um, on the issue of refugees, first, I completely agree with Diana. There's, uh, there's no effort to actually um, organize or uh, help the refugees that exist in Lebanon. At the same time, there's an abuse of their presence on all levels, including political propaganda and, you know, dividing people on sectarian ethnic lines. And in terms of abusing the or, or exploiting the aid that is coming to Lebanon, I completely agree with that. I just want to say as well that um, 
when we talk about uh, obviously there are different there is a different situation when we talk about Palestinian refugees and Syrian refugees it's not that they have different rights not at all but the political situation and the social situation is completely different Palestinian refugees have been in Lebanon for ages right we are talking about the third generation who are now uh, uh, adult or middle aged people in Lebanon who come from a Palestinian background and have been restricted most of them have been restricted to uh, refugee camps with extremely, extremely low socioeconomic uh, situa- um, conditions uh, p- prevented by law from achieving economic prosperity and uh, taking their economic and social rights of any kind. Uh, we're talking about basic things like owning a house, starting a business, uh, getting a, a work permit to work in uh, any of the, of, the, of the good professions in Lebanon, the ones that actually pay money they have been excluded from society based on uh, the Ta'if agreement that ended the civil war and said, okay, the, the Christian right-wing forces were saying the Palestinian refugees are a threat to Lebanon and the left uh, back then was you know, supportive of and, and allied with Palestinian organizations. Uh, so what we do is basically find this middle ground where we completely shut down Palestinians from the whole equation and we rule our country as if there are no Palestinians in Lebanon. They are not living in this miserable situation. So uh, this is a deeply political issue, uh, in my opinion, because it's it's associated with the nature of this political system. Coming the the powerful, the one percent, the, the the sectarian lords, the warlords, the businessmen, they come together and decide who is part of society and who is not, uh, and who gets rights and who doesn't get rights. Uh, so um, and the issue of Syrian refugees is. Is not as confusing as, as, as some people think. Uh, you need aid, you need temporary settlement, uh, you need educational and economic opportunities meanwhile, and you need a safe return. Uh, you cannot kick uh, people out of the country because uh, you don't want them here. You, 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 like any basic human rights uh, uh, value would tell you that uh, the least you can do is actually uh, make sure that they have a safe return to their country. And in the, in the light on, of, of a Syrian regime, um, restricting more and more and consolidating power more and more in Syria uh, and uh, persecuting people who have uh, have become refugees in Lebanon and in other countries based on their political opinions. This is not possible, okay? If, if, if Bashar al-Assad is ruling Syria and uh, uh, will, per- will persecute anyone who comes back to Syria, then you cannot kick people back out of your country back to Syria. This is a criminal activity. So all of this, uh, the, the, the discourse around refugees is basically just fuel for propaganda that is uh, seeking to play on the fears, as Diana was saying, rather than on really what's happening and what we need to do. Um, in terms of the solution to the Lebanese crisis today, to the crisis in Lebanon today, I don't think the refugee question is the most important one because what we're talking about right now is basically a, a system, a political economic system that is collapsing and it needs support, right? And it's, it's asking for people to support me, give me a lifeline, give pump oxygen back in the system so that we can stay in power and we can continue governing. Uh, the issue is primarily there and we have to focus on that issue because when we talk about economics, as uh, Rosalie was saying, when we talk about economics and economic policy, immediately we find ourselves discussing politics. Just look at the last government. Look at what uh, what Hassan Diab, the previous prime minister, the current caretaking prime minister, uh, what he faced when he was in, in, uh, in, um, in government. So I'm not saying that he had great intentions or anything. I didn't believe in his government from day one. But what we saw clearly is that any attempt to uh, enact any laws that are necessary in this moment, any attempt to even estimate the cost of the crisis, like the government did its, in its uh, recovery, uh, economic recovery or financial recovery plan. Um, any attempt of such uh, of, of being honest with people will be shut down by political forces. We had a capital controls law. Rosalie talked about capital controls and they are very important because billions of dollars from the super rich and the political connected have been smuggled out of the country since the banks have imposed a freeze on people's money and have confiscated people's money in, in October 2019. Billions and billions of dollars have been smuggled out because there is no official capital controls law who enacts a capital controls law and who prevented this capital controls law from being enacted in the previous government, it's the political forces coming together and saying, okay, this, is, this will harm our interests and the interests of the 1%. It's, not, it's off the table, we'll not do it. A haircut on the richest in Lebanon is the same issue. 
uh, the, the issue of haircut was turned into some political uh, bickering and then it was off the table as well because simply because uh, these those in power don't have the how don't have an interest in doing that any kind of policy that you can think of that can solve the economic situation or financial situation in Lebanon today will be opposed and shut down by those in power. So to think of political, as you were saying, Bente, in the beginning, to think of political and economic change as two different things, uh, that's quite impossible. That's very naive. And uh, uh, we saw from the previous government that even if you bring some experts and some advisors like Hassan Diab did, you cannot reach anywhere, and what you will end up with is what happened to him, which is the director of the finance ministry resigning, saying the central bank and the commercial banks will not allow the government to do anything. Another member of the negotiation team with the IMF resigning as well for this exact same reason. And they realize at that moment that the political economy of Lebanon is controlled by uh, this small class of people who will prevent any serious policies from taking place. So, uh, to be really realistic today, what we can think of in terms of economic reforms cannot be separated from political reforms at all. Uh, international support that comes to Lebanon today in the form of, center of uh, the World Bank program, in the form of IMF uh, bailout or program, all of this will be funding the political establishment in Lebanon and reviving it and ensuring its continuity without serious political change. And we talked about that before in terms of uh, the parliamentary elections and the other uh, reforms that we need. Without serious political change, it's impossible to have good economic change in Lebanon. This is pessimistic, but it's only realistic. And we have to, uh, we can't like be kind of hanging uh, with illusions uh, anymore and trying to say, okay, maybe they will be now more prone to achieving this or that reform. Am I speaking too fast? Yes. Okay, sorry. Um, we can't have these illusions that, uh, you know, right now it will be different and they will accept to do the reforms that they haven't done in the past. These are people fighting for their power, okay? If Nabi Hibri and Nasrallah and Jumblat and these people and Aoun, etc., are out of power, what will happen is that the new people who will come in will look at the records, will look at what happens, and they will start holding them accountable, right? So we're not only talking about exploiting the resources of the next... Uh, aid that comes to Lebanon. We're also talking about simply uh, accountability and the fact that they are preventing in any way possible. They are preventing accountability from happening. And this is why they will not leave power without uh, continuous uh, uh, democratic, uh, without the democratic transition based and supported primarily by a new political movement. And one last comment on that, because many questions have been about this in the Q&A and the chat. Uh, the, there is a question, obviously, there is a confusion around the fact that there is no opposition in Lebanon or that alternative movements aren't strong enough, etc. I talked about that in the beginning. There are serious problems uh, that have to be dealt with for these movements to grow and to represent more people, etc. Uh, but to think today that people are back to their political affiliations the same way they were a few years ago is a mistake. There is no, first of all, there's no data that, uh, that provides this conclusion at all. And second of all, you saw in the streets of Lebanon, at many moments, the people are very angry and very rejecting of uh, this political establishment. And we saw many uh, experiences of organizing that are very interesting. Obviously, people sometimes maybe, uh, um, when they think about opposition, they only think of political parties that are hierarchical, that have one leader, a uh, clear leader who you know everyone follows, etc. Uh, but we had other experiences that are more grassroots and more horizontal, including one that I was part of called Lihaqi, which started as a political, as a parliamentary electoral campaign back in 2018, and without any resources whatsoever, without any money, uh, carried out an electoral campaign gathering 10,000 votes in, in one district of Lebanon, uh, in a very difficult political context where public events were not allowed to be held, where people were uh, socially persecuted for taking the stance, where people were kicked out of their jobs because of this, they were supporting our project. These, they were serious obstacles and it was before the uprising and we achieved a certain breakthrough by gathering a certain popular coalition only because we were organizing on the grassroots level. And on the grassroots level is where change happens. You can have the best discourse. You can have the ideal positionality on every topic you can think of, be super progressive on everything. But then when it comes to actually how, who do you represent and who are you organizing, 
this is the weak point of most political groups in Lebanon, and this is where they should be working on in the future, in my opinion, be having grassroots presence across the country and having people uh, actually adopt their vision and their project and carrying it themselves. It's through political involvement that political change happens. Thank you. I have one question here that relates to that, and actually I would like uh, to, um, uh, to cluster here a number of questions that are not exactly related, so I'll target them, uh, Joachim. Here is a question. How does HBS work to support such kind of movements that Nizar just mentioned? How is it possible to work with them or others? And what does HBS do? And then I'd also la uh, like to ask you, given that the foundation also is looking into gendered understandings of things, how much do we understand about how the crisis and the different crises affect particularly women? How do they how do the crises affect women differently, possibly? I mean, we saw some examples of how decision making affects women already in some minor details uh, to the understanding of politicians when there was a list of goods that should be subsidized. This list was done by men and it was very much focused on products they considered relevant uh, that were not, uh, not addressing women's sanitary needs, for example. But we have certainly data and understandings of the major uh, impact that this crisis has on men, women and children in a different way. So if you could take these two questions and then Rosalie, I'd also um, I'd like to give a set of questions to you. These are regarding, on the one hand, the Lebanese diaspora and the role that it can play. If I'm not mistaken, money being sent by Lebanese abroad, being brought into the country by Lebanese from abroad has always been essential and a very big factor of the Lebanese economy. How does that work now? How, how important is the Lebanese diaspora in keeping things running and in getting out of the crisis and the fresh money regulations and the fresh and non-fresh money, has it changed? How much actually, how much capital is um, coming into Lebanon through the diaspora. And then there is one question that is once again at the, um, at the well, it's a political construct that came out of the years of civil war, I, I think, the strength of the private sector in education, in health, in electricity, in water provision even. We always have uh, like the governmental system, the public system, but then a very, very strong private sector. And there is one question, to what extent is it helpful? And I would also like to ask to what extent is it a hindrance? Maybe Diana, if you could uh, come to that later. But yes, maybe let's start with a question regarding the impact on women and what HBS is doing to support movements. Uh, thank you, Benton. Thanks for the questions. So I start with the, the question what we do. Um, aside from working with established civil society and cooperating and supporting established civil society organizations like those we mentioned earlier, um, um, we do talk and we do try to talk and to understand um, the emerging political groups, the movements, the grassroots um, movement that uh, Nizar uh, was talking about. Um, other than with established uh, NGOs, um, of course, Heinrich uh, Stiftung yeah, as an intern, as an external actor. Sorry, of course, not an intern, as an external. Because Sorry, did I talk like, did I talk while uh, being un, while the microphone was on mute? Oh, oh, oh sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, again, um, uh, the first question was what we do and how do we um, um, uh, communicate, to put it like this, with the, the alternative political scene and movements and parties. So uh, on one hand, we work with established um, civil society organizations. Uh, we mentioned two before, the issues um, related to the electoral law, reform of electoral law and creating 
a base, um, a social base, and, and and also public awareness. Um, how to reform and how to realistically reform uh, um, running ahead you know, towards uh, elections, if there will be any elections uh, to come. That's one thing. The on the judiciary, uh, we work with uh, NGOs and many other issues. With um, the emerging political groups, we talk to them and we seek to talk to them and we network. As an external actor, we uh, do not directly interfere in internal politics by supporting a political group or one political party um, financially. Uh, this, I don't think this is our role, but our role is to understand who is out there, the reform agendas uh, who are out there, and um, how the public system needs to reform to allow those groups, um, movements, and parties to play a role. This is actually, I think, an important uh, task uh, we have. And to communicate about that internationally, um, uh, we as a German organization to a German audience, etc. Now, Bente, the second question from the second question from the audience was actually how do the multiple crises affect women differently than men, or vulnerable groups uh, like um, differently than men? Um, I think there's one group. Maybe uh, I mean, one group we didn't mention at all, but uh, it shows how, how you know, clearly they are affected by the crisis, which is the group of migrant workers, uh, most of them female, coming from countries like Ethiopia or uh, Sri Lanka or other countries, who basically work under a system in, in Lebanon that doesn't give them any rights. And um, the, the economic crisis, the, 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 the shortage of US dollars or foreign currency, um, you know, the, 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 the whole breakdown of economics and the social situation um, affects uh, have very, you know, extremely on them. And uh, uh, there are women who are camping in front of uh, their embassies, for example, the Ethiopian embassies, because they were like thrown on the street by their employers, um, etc. So this is just one example. I think there are many other examples, uh, um, as well among the, the Syrian refugee communities um, who have to bear uh, severe effects of the, of, of the economic crisis. And um, uh, clearly there needs to do, you know, a lot to, to be done to address this. But I think these two examples show how women and vulnerable groups, not only women, people who are socially vulnerable um, do suffer um, to a great extent from from the crisis. Thank you, Joachim. Uh, Rosalie, would you come to the question of the impact and the possibilities of the Lebanese diaspora? Yes, sure. And it's a, it's a very important question, actually. So um, I'll try and speak slower. So um, the, uh, the diaspora in Lebanon is, is extremely important. So I was referring earlier to the fact that the system right now, the economic system right now, is is designed in a way so that uh, you know young talent are pushed away. So it's it, it is a system that kind of nurture future expatriation. But it's but it's it's just always been the case in Lebanon. Like the the country has always sent a large part of its population abroad. So it's it's not always a I mean like it's not always a bad thing. Um, remittances have supported the Lebanese economy for, for decades. Actually, one of the factors that led to the Great Famine of the 1915-1918 was the fact that remittances from Lebanese 
in Italy and, and other places were blocked by the blockade. So one that was that's not it's not the main reason, but it's one of the reasons. So you know, like it's always those will have been an important economic factor uh, in Lebanon. So it's it's uh, more recently uh, you were asking for numbers. So what we had is what I have is what you know, before the crisis, so before the 17 October revolution, before that even. Uh, I know that the, the economic uh, crisis has started already, but that's a that's, uh, figure from, uh, from before uh, 2019. In, in, in these years, um, the remittances in Lebanon, so direct remittances, so that would mean money sent directly from people abroad to, to families here, would represent between 15 and 20 percent of the GDP, so that's that's enormous in terms of in terms of amount. That's a huge complement for for family who's who are struggling. And in the and in in the way in the way it's used, so there's uh, several studies. One one showed that it's usually used for education, um, uh, paying the hospital bill or or medical bill. So you know it's it's used for practical needs. It's not you know, it's not mainly used for for consumption. But another problem like that relates to this in in the dias in the use of diaspora um, resources is the fact that also forty percent of the deposits were uh, estimated to be from abroad, and these deposits were not invested in anything productive. So these deposits were either invested in the rent economy of the debt through through the banking sector or from the real estate in the real estate sector, which then led to the the real estate bubble making housing and affordable for most Lebanese in Lebanon. So, you know, like you have this two elements. So you have, you have what is, you know, what is helping Lebanese and, and what's sustaining the, the problem of the system. It's, it's not usually like, it's not usually you have bad remittances or, 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 or and good remittances. It's usually, you know, it's, it's a mix of both for, for, for most, um, for most people, but it's the two aspects are important. Um, now, the, the, the way I think the diaspora is helping and is already doing it well is the fact that, you know, Lebanese even abroad retain a, a high, you know, relationship and a, and, a, and a strong tie to their country. They always, you know, they, they want to support, they want to help. So we've seen, you know, on a very um, 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 small, it's not small scale, but it's, you know, it's starting. So different initiatives where you could uh, you know hire Lebanese here to do freelance jobs or that you could support I don't know either artists or people who cannot leave the country so you know like support with this kind of uh, you know you have a need that could be done by somebody working remotely and you're interested in helping Lebanon you know hire Lebanese uh, who can do that from Lebanon so it gives them opportunity uh, and uh, and it also brings them it also brings the country uh, much needed currency and then you have various support groups, uh, uh, you know, in different in different sectors. So, so Lebanese in the diaspora have been helpful, and I think have a role to play. And I think they already kind of know uh, quite well how to do that. So it's it's very spontaneous. We've seen it with the with the blasts. You know, a lot of spontaneous group, uh, you know, forming around uh, one uh, one one person who's in Lebanon who's collecting among friends to you know restore the a neighbor's flat or you know give to that and this and that hospital so i think that we see and that's that's working well and and and, and lebanese do do actually um do that well already the main problem before was the fact that some of it some of the money and some of the resources were diverted by the fact that the system was a you know the rent a rent economy and and i think this is this is where uh you know, if we reform the economic sector, um, you know, we can tap into this uh, into these resources uh, with uh, with greater efficiency. And one last point I wanted to mention because because you were you were referring to you know any changes. So we don't really have figures, but one uh, change we know happened is the fact that for a while the financial system make it made it very difficult. For people to receive remittances, so you had you either had to withdraw it in Lebanese pound, although it was sent in dollar or any foreign currency, at a rate that was you know way below the the the, the market rate or the you know the, the rate you could get on the on the street, and uh, and so I think that that was a that was a, 
a real problem. So I, I feel it's this problem has been uh, partially solved, but that was, you know, that was a, a real problem. Thank you, Rosalie. I mean, we see with the sizes that you've mentioned of contributions and remittances that come from abroad, how relevant this factor is and that that possibly also would be something to look into further. Um, now, when it comes to the private sector as hindrance or, or, or opportunity, Diana, what would you say when we try to see to the future would that part need to change? Would distribution between what is shouldered by the private sector and what the state takes as public uh, duties, would that need to change as well? Well, we have to look at, at what happened previously. Uh, during the war, before the war, we had a vital uh, private sector in Lebanon and it helped Lebanese society and Lebanese community uh, sustain during the civil war because we have a strong private sector. After the war, the private sector played a major role again, but this time uh, there were, were some intersections between banks, private sector, and political elite. Unfortunately, we found some of, of major uh, private sector players become part of the corrupt uh, system in Lebanon. So now, definitely, we should have a, a major uh, role for the private sector. But I think the transparency, the accountability, the way this private sector should move forward is something should be monitored closely. We cannot repeat what happened uh, before October 17 when we had the financial uh, collapse. The collapse was not only the banking system. If you look at some names, at some of politicians, you will find some intersection between all those uh, uh, fields. So in a nutshell, Yes, private sector is something essential in Lebanon and they, it should play a major role, but not as the role it played in the previous years. We should be more vigilant, more transparent, and look carefully on who is going to play a role and on what, in which field. Thank you. And Nizar, since you also mentioned the social justice as one of the three pillars that initially you introduced, uh, would you have a brief and please also slow comment on that? Sure. Um, by the way, just a note, I might, if, if I cut at any point, it's because my internet is running out. Um, anyway, um, before I talk about this, I just need to mention one thing about uh, the role of international organizations and uh, speci specifically political foundations in Lebanon. Uh, Henrich Boll is uh, affiliated probably with, uh, Henrich Boll is probably the least uh, relevant for what I'm saying right now, but German political foundations, as an example, have had very long uh, and hist historical connections with political parties in Lebanon. And today, um, if they are, true to their values, all of these political organizations should break away and cut these uh, links that they have and this support that they have been providing to the sectarian political uh, parties, be it on the supposed left, like the progressive socialist movement, which is basically a sectarian movement run by, in a feudalist way, by a sectarian warlord, or be it on the right with the Kataab and the LF, etc., which are supported by more right-wing political foundations. There is a responsibility for, the, for German political foundations and international organizations in general today to say, to, to end this, uh, this uh, complicity in, uh, in, in supporting uh, these sectarian political parties uh, immediately in Lebanon because uh, they are not only corrupt or, you know, they're not, they don't lack uh, skills or competence or anything. They are literally destroying the country and killing its people. So there's no reason to, uh, there's no justification for this continuous cooperation on any level. Um, when it comes to uh, to what you were talking about, the issue of uh, social justice and the role of the private sector, let's be clear, there's no such thing as a really private sector in Lebanon that you look at and you say, oh, this is, you know, a private sector that is independent from the state, etc. We have a private sector that is composed of very different uh, actors, right? We have the small and, and medium enterprises, which are basically the largest, the most common form of a pub private enterprise in Lebanon. And they are to an extent uh, independent from the central government, right? 
but you have the private sector that has been in bed with the central government and uh, that has produced leadership to this uh, you know management board of lebanon and the management board of lebanon this corrupt political establishment is not only public sector it's also the private sector that has played this major role when you look at the smuggling and the 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 the, the corruption at the seaport in beirut obviously before it was completely destroyed uh, you would see that private sector uh, the private sector is a big and actually the main source of corruption there because it's uh, using its connections to uh, public administration and civil servants in order to uh, smuggle products in or not pay customs etc and you look at electricity you see private companies all the way in the electricity sectors in the sector etc every com every every project that has been carried out in lebanon has been carried out by a private company the state doesn't have the equipment doesn't have the resources it's always paying or uh, uh, contracting a large company to do this job for it for, for the state so which means that the private sector has been actually a main partner a part of the private sector has been a main partner in corruption in lebanon so thinking about it as a public versus private issue is in my opinion not very helpful also, when we talk about the private sector today, it's basically, uh, in a lot of cases, it's a kind of an intro to privatization. It's a, it's a way of saying, okay, the public has failed in Lebanon, let's give it a chance to the private sector. Although what I just said is that the private sector has been in, in bed with the government and has been part of this ruling class. And the issue with this is that privatization today in Lebanon uh, is actually the best gift you can give to the political establishment absolutely the best gift because what's happening is that people are losing leverage and power in the political system to an extent and what you do when you privatize entities at your lowest moment as a state at your lowest economic moment you're selling things for cheap and things these things will have will produce more political and economic leverage in the future it happened in uh, the most famous case that we can think of is russia right uh, after the I'm collapse of Soviet Sorry. sorry, I'm sorry. I think we are running out of time. So uh, while this case is a great cliffhanger, would you mind coming to an end? Um, I mean, I can shut up now or I can say one, say one thing about uh, the diaspora because most questions were uh, concerning the diaspora. If, if you give me two minutes, I can talk about the diaspora. One minute. The diaspora in Lebanon has been uh, used by the political class for a long while as kind of a supportive environment for the system in Lebanon. And today we are seeing a very different uh, situation where large sections of the diaspora are part of the revolution and the uprising and the individual independent, sorry, initiatives uh, for relief and rescue, etc. in the current moment. What we also need from the diaspora apart from this is investment in economic cooperatives and organizations and businesses that are uh, on the grassroots level that provide productive jobs for people on the local level. And we know uh, for sure that the diaspora will have a major role, not only in funding new political movements, but also in voicing and in kind of propagating the voice of these new political movements. So I encourage everyone who is in the diaspora, who is really interested in, in, in making change in Lebanon to join political movements. You can join, there are political movements that have large numbers of, of, uh, of uh, affiliates and uh, organizers abroad, like the political movement and part of Lihaqi, also the party uh, citizens in the state, and many other parties have mobilized the diaspora in one way or another. I encourage everyone in the diaspora to join these political movements and find ways in which they can have political agency beyond sending money to Lebanon. I'm really sorry to cut you short and I'm really sorry to cut basically everybody on the panel short because I see there is still lots of things to be shared and I also see there are some questions in the chat that remained unanswered but the good thing is that each of uh, the wonderful panelists we had and with, uh, with which I really found it very inspiring to talk thank you very much for being with us each of them can be found on Twitter on YouTube on social media so please go and follow Diana Mu'allit go and follow Nizara Hassan and uh, Lebanese politics podcasts, find signups and read the excellent analysis that Rosalie and her colleagues are providing. And please also follow our office and follow what Joachim Paul is sharing in terms of his insights on Lebanon. It was really great to have you here.
Thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for listening to us. Thank you to the interpreters and to my colleagues who are here in the background making this all happen. It was really amazing and I hope to have you here again. Thank you. Thanks Thank for you organizing. So much for having us. Thank, Thank you. you.